with a quick introduction and we'll just be recording this so that we can put it on uh, our YouTube channel so you can follow up or go back and revisit the information if you want at a later date and Brad will also put up, we'll put up the slides as well. Um, so just to start with, I'm Marika Batterham. I'm the coordinator of the Data and Decision Science Initiative here at the University of Wollongong, which is part of our strategic plan to increase our capacity in data science. I'm also the director of the National Institute of Applied Statistics Research Australia and the Stats Consulting Centre. And I'm really passionate about data literacy, which is why I'm so keen about these network meetings. And I'll, and I'll hand over to Brad to introduce himself as well. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm Dr. Brad Wakefield. I'm a statistical consultant in the Stats Consulting Centre. Um, I've been a consultant here for a few years now. Um, and my interests are in data privacy, probability theory, statistical inference and data analytics, um, and also in data visualization and of course, statistical consulting, which I love to do. I really have a passion for ethical applications of data science. Um, it's something I care about deeply and I enjoy uh, learning and collaborating with other disciplines and solving real world problems. It makes me very good for statistical consulting, will love my job. Um, and as you can tell, I'm, I'm always up for a chat. So um, I'm pretty talkative. You'll, you'll discover that if you didn't already know after our, after our seminar today. Okay, so just a really quick introduction to the Data and Decision Science Initiative. As I mentioned, it's part of the UOW strategic plan. And it developed from a report back in 2019 and it commenced in July, 2021. And if on the next slide, thanks Brad. Okay, so there are four components and the one that we're involved with today is part of the first component. So that's a virtual network of and working groups of data and decision science researchers throughout the university and we hold theme meetings which emphasize translation. So that's the purpose of the seminar today. We also provide education. So we do internal and external training and education in data science. And we're really keen to upskill research students and staff, particularly early career researchers in data and decision science methods. We also run workshops and we also have a focus on looking at our undergraduate subjects and trying to give more of a data science focus particularly in the quantitative subjects, but also to ensure that all our graduates are literate in data science and reproducible research. And we also have a focus on external and industry engagement. Okay, so that's it from me. I'll hand over now to Brad. Yeah, and I just wanna mention the, the data science and statistics community of practice, which hopefully a few of you are joining for uh, from today. Um, the, the, the community of practice was really established as a dedicated, um, mostly online network to help provide uh, collaboration and uh, statistical support for researchers, HDR students and academics more broadly. Um, and so it, it, essentially it's a Teams meeting um, and you can post in the forum. There is also a website attached where there will be various um, resources, including um, a template for the statistical analysis plan that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I'll put the link in the chat in case anyone uh, is present who hasn't already joined. Um, and you can have a look, check out the Teams meeting. Um, various, whenever there's an event that pops up to do with data science or statistics, we always pop it in that chat and forum to promote it. So it's a good way uh, to keep in touch as well with you know what's happening and what what workshops and seminars are going on at UOW to help um, upskill in in data science and statistics. Alrighty, so let's talk about uh, why we're kind of here today, and that is to talk about statistical analysis plans and research data management. Um, and you know, I'm a I'm a mathematician statistician at heart, so I always start every every talk with a definition. Um, and that is a definition on what is a statistical analysis plan. Um, it, so a, a statistical analysis plan or a SAP is a detailed predefined blueprint outlining the methodologies and procedures for statistically analyzing data in a research study. So uh, basically it's, a, it's an outline, it's a plan that you establish essentially at the start of your research project, um, which 
lays out what steps you're going to do in order to meet your research objectives and analyze the data that you will collect. Um, and there's some really key advantages of using a statistical analysis plan. Number one, it mitigates the risks of problems in the analysis. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but essentially, you know, when you plan things out, you start to think about potential problems. And once you've kind of collected data, it's usually too late to go back and do anything about it. So if you've got a good idea of where your analysis is going um, and you know what analysis you're going to be doing, you can make sure you get the right data at the start where you can change what data you're collecting rather than at the end when you go, oh, I wish I had done it differently. Another key advantage of it is that it provides a transparent overview of the research from the very onset, um, which allows people to properly review your methodology, um, if you're a student, it shows your supervisors, you know, what, what steps you're looking at um, implementing for your, for your research study, but also um, it allows, you know, proper oversight, essentially, a, a, an overall plan. And you can share this as well um, after you publish your research, just so actually, no, we did do kind of a plan and this or everything kind of went to plan or we had to change things. Um, so it, it also provides that additional documentation to essentially boost the the um, like the reliability and reproducibility of your of your uh, analysis um the big thing though is that it protects against data dredging and I'll, and I'll talk very specifically about data dredging in a moment but data dredging in a moment and it promotes reproducibility so uh essentially you know you can provide a statistical analysis plan to alternative researchers and they can follow the same process as you and hopefully end up with the same results you do. So it allows your data to be uh, to checked and open and all the processes really you know, up and um, available for everyone to see. So what is data dredging? Data dredging is also known as data phishing or p-hacking. Um, and it's essentially, it refers to the process of um, extensively performing analysis on a data set until you find something that's significant or find some trend or find some pattern um, without you know, initially setting out to discover that trend or pattern. Um, and it, essentially, it's a really labor intensive process of just performing analysis and seeing what sticks. Um, and there are, you know, some real problems with doing that. Um, the big one is what we call the false positive bias. So, uh, you know, when we incorrectly reject a null hypothesis, and a lot of the times when we're doing statistical analysis, what we are doing is some form of hypothesis testing. Um, if we incorrectly reject a null hypothesis, we call that a false positive, okay? It's also called a type one error. Um, and it, usually uh, we control that error rate by the significance level, your 5%, the 5% everyone knows and loves. Um, but what that actually means is that 5% of the time, you know, we would expect a false positive result if, we, if everything worked out in the sampling theory. So if I did 100 tests, I did 100 tests, we would expect to make a type one error one in 20 times, right? Um, which means that if you do extensive analyses, there's a much greater chance that you're going to you know, identify, if you're just searching for any significant result, there's a much greater chance that you're going to uh, stumble across a false positive. And so only reporting significant results after performing lots of tests creates a bias towards false positives. All right, so uh, essentially, you know, if we instead, if we pre-plan our analysis, if we say we're only going to look at these specific objectives, we can make sure that we haven't data dredged, we haven't been influenced by what the results, um, you know, are indicating towards, you know, if I just add that covariate, I will get a significant result, or if I just drop that off, or if I just regroup my data in this very specific way, it's going to lead to a significant result. If we instead as much as possible, pre-plan our analysis, um, then we can be sure that the results we achieve are genuine, are, are kind of as a result of the variation and not be influenced by our, our bias towards wanting significant results. And often it's not, you know, often people who who change their analysis, they, it's an unconscious thing. You just can't help but want to you know, explore and identify and search for patterns. And so setting this out at the starting point really is protection, you know, for yourself to make sure that you're really clear on what analyses you're going to perform. 
Um, the other thing is that pre-registration of SAPs and protocols are often required for clinical trials, um, although they're not common for non-clinical studies at the moment. Um, but, you know, there is a growing push towards greater reproducibility and greater kind of accountability in our analyses. And so, you know, down the track, there might be, a, it might become more regular for non-clinical studies as well, not just clinical trials, um, to require pre-registration of your analysis plans and protocols um, before publication. Um, and, you know, essentially a statistical analysis plan is best practice for analysis, right? Um, I know the Australian Clinical Trials Alliance recommends, says that every clinical trial should have some kind of statistical analysis plan or protocol. So this is really kind of the, the gold standard for how you should be doing your analysis. And we're uh, in a community of practice and a data science network. We, we are, you know, trying to foster and support um, best practice in our, in our quantitative analysis. Um, I, I have talked about reproducibility, and I just want to give a quick definition on what, what I mean by that, because often it can be kind of confused re repeatability and replica uh, re re replicability. Um, and that is that reducibility is specifically the ability for independent investigators to draw the same conclusions from an experiment by following the documentation shared by the original investigator. So it's not necessarily repeating the experiment, um, but looking at, you know, what data uh, was collected and how it was collected and um, following the processes of analyses to achieve the same results. Um, now, not to say that a statistical analysis plan can't be used to improve uh, replicability um, because it also allows uh, people to follow an outline of what people have done. Um, but in particular, you know, we're focusing on reproducibility and, you know, if, if research is re reproducible, then an independent researcher should be able to produce the exact same analysis visualizations. Um, as what was attained initially. Okay, so uh, a statistical analysis plans, um, you know, allow us to plan ahead. And when we plan ahead, you know, we can we can hopefully protect against making, you know, decisions that inordinately impact the resulting analysis. And seemingly small decisions at the very start of a, of a study, you know, what categories am I going to use for demographics? Or, um, you know, what, what dem demographics or characteristics am I going to collect? Or, um, you know, what, what score or measure am I going to um, use in order to measure this outcome? Um, all of those decisions often get made at the very start. But the consequences of those, those decisions aren't really felt until you've got the data and you're trying to analyze them. And so at that stage, it's too late to do anything about it or to change. You can't go out and resample people most of the time. And so having a plan ahead, make sure that you're not going to fall victim of, you know, small, really understandable mistakes at the start, um, causing you all sorts of problems at the end with your analysis. Um, so they also formally outline how research objectives are measured. And so it makes clear, very clear um, in your statistical analysis plan that, you know, your goals, your aims are actually achievable based on your study protocol. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about research questions a lot, but their, their research questions can actually be quite complicated things. And often we make the mistake of making them too broad, particularly when we're trying to... Um, use quantitative analysis to address them. And when we try, we go to, you know, to perform our analysis, we might not necessarily have the, or have the resources to properly address the research question we initially set out. And so instead, when we plan things forward with a statistical analysis plan, we can kind of alter our research questions at the very start of the study to make sure that it actually resolves um, in an achievable outcome or achievable goal. So we aren't left with just inconclusive research um, and it, it's important to note that, you know, although we we're going to talk about the research question, the research objectives very first, um, throughout the drafting of a statistical analysis plan, you're going to be kind of constantly reevaluating that research question, those research objectives and go, okay, well, you know, I've, I've thought about this problem with my data or with my measure. And so, you know, do I need to be more specific? Should I restrict my population of interest or should I change, um, you know, what, what exact measure and how that measure should be communicated 
Um, so it, I, I would consider this entire process of producing a statistical analysis plan as also reaffirming and making sure you really nail down on what the specific research question you're going to set out, set out to study um, will be. All right, so that was my kind of rough overview of what is a statistical analysis plan. Now let's get into the kind of uh, specific points of how you actually build one. Um, and the first section, we'll all talk, we'll all really talk about the study protocol or how the study is going to be performed. Because how the study is going to performed, be performed and what variables you're going to measure is, of course, going to impact what analysis can be achieved. So when you're developing a research question, there are a lot of things to consider. You know, you want to you want to meet certain objectives. You want your research to be novel. You want it to be new. You also want it to be you know, feasible. You know, you, everyone only has finite resources. And so it has to be achievable within the time frame you set out. You know, um, we have to think about costs. We have to think about how you're actually going to collect the data. You got to think of, you know, what sample size you're going to achieve, what role of randomization. There, there is a lot of things to consider when you're putting together a research question. Um, but it's important, you know, when we when we start to develop our statistical analysis plan to really kind of nail down on a few key questions. And what I've done is put kind of a simplified question and then the terminology we're going to use to essentially address that or what that relates to. So the first kind of question you want to ask is what, what is the problem? What, what is the thing that you want to study? What is the purpose of this ultimate research? And that's what we're going to refer to as the objectives of our research. Um, and part of looking at the objectives of the research is, you know, why is this interesting? Why, why bother going out and studying a particular idea or a problem? Um, why are you interested? What's your personal motivation? Um, has this been previously studied? And it's really important to, to, you know, get an idea of what's already been done on this subject, what has not been previously addressed, or what has been addressed, but maybe not the best, or maybe you want to, you know, uh, validate or or repeat something that's already been done. So having a good understanding of the literature is going to really help inform that those objectives as well. It's also important to consider what your research will contribute, and that's what we kind of call the novelty. What what is what is what is new? What is the what is the um, benefit that your research is going to have? Um, what is the relevance of it? Right. Um, and then of course we have to think about what ethical implications there are. Um, for performing this research and you know are we constrained by certain in certain tasks or certain um, uh, you know activities because of the ethical concerns uh, related to it and also importantly particularly for us researchers who don't often get a lot of money um, is the you know do I have the resources the time to be able to um, you know achieve these objectives and perform this study and so all of these things lead into you know what is what is the problem, what is the research objective, um, and you know, can we actually achieve them? And uh, I, I will recommend there is a criteria you know, or a, a kind of a, a, an acronym used for helping produce research questions. Um, it's called FINA. You can check it out um, in the, the citation I've given before. But if you just Google it, FINA research questions, there's also a kind of a, a detailed explanation of what kind of considerations you should have um, when you know, building these research objectives and research questions. The other important thing to consider uh, when starting a statistical analysis plan is who or what are, am I going to be studying? You know, uh, if it's a who, you know, who, what, what population of interest, where, you know, where they come from. Um, if it's a what, you know, what natural phenomena and I'm, am I going to be studying and how am I going to collect that data? And what, what would a, a kind of, it, it, do I want to, uh, you know, get an idea of a, a rough population at hand or, um, you know, do I want to kind of narrow in and just describe a, a particular pop, a cohort or group? Um, we also have to consider, you know, who you would like to study versus who you can actually feasibly study, right? Like who you can actually recruit to be part of this study. And often those two things don't match up. Um, and so, which, you know, we have to consider, well, if this is the population of interest, who is it that I could possibly recruit to represent that population of interest? And are they representative of that population of interest? Or is, you know, the, there a mismatch there? Um, 
if 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 it's not important to have representativity, if you're just trying to describe a cohort, then maybe a descriptive analysis is the best way to go. But if representativity is important, then you know we will have to do some kind of inferential analysis, and we will have to kind of um, you know consider some of the implications of our sampling method and our, our sample selection. Um, how I recruit my subjects will, of course, impact the representativity of those subjects. Um, and will, in the selection of my sampling frame, or in my sample, will I over or under represent particular cohorts? And we call this selection bias. You know, I, is, is there a particular demographic or cohort who are just never going to be represented because, you know, you know maybe I'm doing an online panel and they don't have Facebook or something like that. Um, we have to consider where is that mismatch? And I've got a little diagram here to help kind of think about this. You know, if your target population is that red thing, um, we have to also think about, you know, who is it that we could possibly select? And that's what we call our sampling frame. And nested within that sampling frame are all the people we're going to recruit. And part of that recruitment also might mean excluding some people who you know, followed, our, followed our links um, but aren't necessarily part of the target population. And so then we will need to develop some kind of exclusion criteria. And of course, um, the converse of that is people who are in that target population, they're gonna form our inclusion criteria. Um, but these people out here in this pure red area, we're never going to be able to contact them. So they're going to be underrepresented in our sample. And so we have to think, well, is this sampling frame a kind of a, a representative cross-section? Have I take, is this a sample? Or are there something systematic about the people in this, this red area? And how will that impact my results? Um, and that's something that we need to think about at the point of data collection. Now, you know, I could go into a, a, a long explanation about different sampling methods. Um, we usually class them into two different types, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Probability sampling is all about preserving that representativity. Um, and that's things like, you know, you come up with a, a set list of people and you randomly select people and um, to be in your sample and then you hound them into agreeing to be part of that sample. Whereas non-probability sampling is usually what, you know, uh, most of us have to do. It is, you know, sending out volunteer, it might be a, you know, volunteer survey, it might be a, a, a post on social media. Um, you know, the non-probability sampling is not necessarily representative. So we have to kind of think of how do we kind of adjust or um, contextualize our data or look for indicators of the representativeness and potential sources of bias in our data. So these are these are the kind of the things we should be thinking about when we're when we're producing our sample. How how generalizable really our, our analysis is going to be. And so how do we assess kind of the level of bias? Well, we might have a look at a particular kind of the characteristics or the demographics of the sample that we end up collecting and compare it to benchmarks. Right. If I know that roughly 50% of my population is supposed to be uh, female and male, then if I end up with 70% of my sample being female, then I'm probably uh, underrepresenting males. Right. And I know that there's a selection bias. So, um, you know, we can use demographics or characteristics as indicators. Now, that doesn't necessarily guarantee representativity, but it's at least a way of kind of indicating whether or not we are over or underrepresenting particular individuals. Uh, we should also consider whether or not there are any uh, characteristics that may interfere with my study. So any kind of factors not accounted for that might drive particular trends, we call them confounders. Um, we also need to consider, uh, you know, should I, should I restrict my sample um, to avoid those? You know, if someone's taking some kind of uh, alternative medication and I'm looking at um, the effect of a specific medication, maybe I need to exclude them because we don't know if the results will be driven by the interaction between two drugs or that drug itself. Um, so thinking about what kind of factors could affect my results that I'm not necessarily accounting for. And of course, sample size. How many people do I expect to get and how many people do I kind of need to get? And we can talk about that um, a little bit more um, later. All right, so that that's kind of like, you know, the, the kind of the key the key building blocks, what, who, what's the purpose and who am I studying? Um, but then we also have to talk about, and this is you know, often where a statistician will start looking at this problem, is what will I actually be measuring? What will I be, what will I be recording? 
Um, so, uh, you know, we, we use the term variable in statistics a lot of the time. And essentially, a variable refers to a quantity or characteristics that can take on different values or categories. Variables are used to represent and measure different attributes or features of a population or a sample. And we usually class variables into kind of two main categories. We call them quantitative variables or qualitative variables. Um, but that can sometimes get a little bit confusing with quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis. So we we sometimes use instead numeric variables and categorical variables um, and to describe quantitative and qualitative variables. Um, and essentially the difference is that a quantitative variable has a numeric meaning to it, um, whereas a qualitative variable represents a, a categorization or an attribute. We will also... Whoop, we also will look at different prescribed roles of variables. So some variables will have different roles in our analysis. Now, this aren't something that is inherent about that particular data type. This is all down to the research questions and the research objectives. And you know, when we just when we have a dependent variable, we've actually prescribed that role. That's something that analysis that the analyst will do. Um, in one person's study, you know, BMI could be a dependent variable. In another person's study, it could be an independent variable. So it really should be based on what the research objectives are, what roles we prescribe. And for dependent variables, dependent variables are variables we want to predict or explain. Um, and it, and they, you know, we have different kind of, I would say, subcategories or subterms that we can apply to a dependent variable. We can call it an outcome variable. And that, that, that specifically refers to variables that relate to a particular outcome or measure the success or failure of a study. We can also use the term response variables when we're really just looking at the interaction between um, a, a variable and some other kind of variable, some other kind of independent variable and how that dependent variable responds to a change in the independent variable. You can also use the term endogenous variables, and that's often seen in kind of more kind of causal inference and in structural equation modeling and those kinds of things. Um, and then in machine learning, we tend to use the uh, the terminology target or output variables. Um, and usually that's referring to the thing that we're trying to predict, right? Uh, we can also, I, I mentioned independent variables, but what are independent variables? Independent variables describe the variables that are being studied to control or assess their effect on the dependent variable. So they're the things that we're trying to look at associations between the dependent variable and the independent variable. We can use kind of two, we can kind of broadly classify them as an exposure variable, which roughly means a variable of interest that participants may encounter or possess, which research is examined for its potential influence on the dependent variables. Um, we can use the term exposure for both observational and experimental studies. This, uh, you know, if something's an exposure variable, it's kind of the primary um, variable you want to check the association with the dependent variable, right? It's the kind of the key part of your study that you want to investigate. Um, we can also use the term intervention variable when we are specifically um, talking about an experimental study, and that refers to something that uh, the researchers have, have you know, purposefully changed or a specific conditional component that have been manipulated by the researchers in order to assess the effect on the dependent variable. Um, and the, the other thing I want to talk about is we also use the term control group, um, and this is for sub this is essentially a group or a cohort of people who aren't exposed to a particular treatment and you know essentially is necessary in, in, in an experimental study in order to evaluate the magnitude of an intervention all right i'm hoping a lot of these terms are, are, are kind of um you know revision or you've heard of these before but it's always good to kind of lay the cards on the table and get a real sense of what it is when we talk about these terms that are in the context of statistical analyses. There are other types of independent variables that we will see. So exposure variables and, or intervention variables tend to be the kind of the key thing we're trying to assess, but sometimes there will be um, other variables we want to account for within our analyses. So confounding variables account for changes in the different variable not associated with the independent or exposure. And so we might want to record them and account for them in an analysis in order to distinguish between the effect of an exposure um, on the dependent variable. We might also um, record what are called effect modifiers, which 
essentially means that they change the way the exposure variable is associated with the dependent variable. Um, you could kind of think of it as, you know, um, you know, think of it something like age and maybe a treatment is more effective the younger you are. And so age will be an effect modifier on a particular treatment um, on, you know, whatever dependent variable we're looking at. We also have what are called control variables, which we don't usually put into the, the analysis, but they're essentially things that we record in order to make sure that we are correctly controlling them, that we're holding them constant throughout the study. So they really are used for indicators to assess whether or not um, our analysis is, you know, is we're, we're properly controlling um, certain aspects of our analysis. Um, we might also record grouping variables and they are used to denote association structures from the data. So maybe I've got, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm researching students um, across New South Wales. I know that students in the same school are gonna be more associated. So I'm going to record the school um, that the students are from to account for that, you know, association structure within my analysis. Um, and the other thing we might be recording are what, what are called, you know, char characteristic demographic variables. And we usually uh, measure these in order to uh, get an idea or to describe the cohort that we're looking at, um, and also to provide indicators on representativity. All right, so um, for each variable collect, you should always consider, you know, do your variables adequately match your objectives? You know, if I'm trying to measure, say, you know, introversion in a particular subject, are the, are the variables that I'm collecting a reliable indicator of introversion? Um, you know, has this been, has this, can I use this in order to measure that particular, um, you know, concept or construct within your objective? Um, you know, when you perform a measurement, is there a time effect? You know, does it change if I measure it in summer or winter? or at what point of the study that I'm going to collect it. And if that's the case, then maybe I need to be looking at using repeated measures, right? We're essentially um, repeating, uh, measuring more than once from the same subject. You should consider, you know, what units you're going to be measuring in. And, you know, it does do, do the units change? You know, if I measure in one unit at, at one point and then I want to try and find another indicator, uh, a, a, you know, measure another, say I use one scale for introversion at the start of the study and then a different scale at the end of the study, they're not really in the same units, are they? So it's hard to kind of compare the change that's occurred in that. Um, are you dealing with independent or paired data? You know, if we're dealing with independent data, that's going to change the way our analysis has worked. But if we're dealing with paired data, we might have to consider things like linkage and how will I, you know, associate you know, uh, the first measurement from a participant with the last measurement from a participant? How, how am I going to call, form that linkage structure and what variables do I need to connect, collect in order to be able to um, perform that linkage? Um, can you assume independence between observations? This is a big issue, particularly in big data. You know, when someone can go on, you know, think about the vote compass data that um, the ABC uses before elections, often people go on and fill that in multiple times and try different parameters. And, you know, is that independent? Is that data being recorded as being um, independent or can that bias the results? Um, will I have missing data? Is that another thing we need to consider? And how will that cause an impact on the sample? Particularly if you're measuring something that's quite sensitive, sensitive or something quite complex which, where respondents might not necessarily know how to respond to a question. Um, and so what role will missing data play in the analysis is something that we should we should really consider and how do we make it as easy as possible for respondents in order to uh, you know minimize the amount of missing data resulting in our sample. All right, so you know that's kind of a, a rough overview of the considerations we should be we should be having when we can when we're trying to list the variables that we're going to be collecting. Um, it's also important, particularly when we go to develop the analysis or uh, select the analysis that we're going to end up doing, is to, to have a look at what type of variables that we're going to be collecting. And we talked about quantitative and qualitative variables, but I'm going to be a little bit more specific here. And we can actually split, split quantitative variables into um, different subgroups. We have what's called discrete quantitative variables, and those are essentially variables in, you know, uh, whole number units, you know, think about count data, um, think about 
potentially ordinal data in some in some um, instances where that 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 bound, that bound is um, uh, quite high. Or we have continuous data, and continuous data means it can take any value on a particular range. Um, so you know, depending on what what type of data you're dealing with, might change what analysis is the most suited in order to analyzing it. So. Um, we also can classify quantitative variables into what's called interval data and ratio data. Um, interval data means that differences are meaningful, but zero is not. A good example of interval data would be, say, like temperature, right? So temperature, zero, if you're a zero degree Celsius, it doesn't mean that you've got no temperature. It just means it's a, it's a point on a scale or on, on an interval. Um, whereas with ratios, you know, you can actually consider you know, oh, this is twice as as effective or twice as large or half as large. or And when we talk about zero, we mean that there's, there's an absence of that property. So, you know, you can think about height or weight. If someone is zero weight, they have no weight, um, whereas people can be, you know, twice as heavy or twice as tall as somebody else. Uh, qualitative variables, um, we have nominal which basically means categorical with no ordering structure so think you know if i'm talking about colors of balls in a bag red blue and green um you know you could think of something like gender that, that's a categorical variable there's no inherent ordering structure in it but an ordinal variable is a categorical variable with an inherent ordering structure sometimes we might get something in our data sets that look a bit like this um, and I've got my symptoms column. And what I've done is I've just checked in the symptoms column, you know, is pain in the arm being recorded here? And so we compute out a kind of a more condensed qualitative variable from text information. So when we're dealing with qualitative variables, um, sometimes that there is a bit more um, kind of what we call coding involved with it and something we should consider um, when we're re recording values. Okay, uh, that's kind of your your kind of your, your crash course in data types and data variables. Again, this is all going to lead into choosing the statistical analysis. So if you can identify what variable types you're dealing with early, that's going to really help when you choose the statistical analysis method uh, later on. Um, another key point we should consider is what randomization may be involved um, in your study. Now, this is specific to experimental studies. Um, where we actually have the control of assigning treatments to particular individuals. Um, and essentially, we use randomization in order to kind of get two representative samples in both treatment groups. And if we can do that, if we can have by random, if we can randomize across treatment groups, then it means that we should, in theory, have an equal impact of you know, potential confounders and unknown factors in each treatment group. And if that's the case, then we know that the only that, that if there's a difference between the treatment groups, then that's only really due to the difference in treatment, because they should be equally likely to have represented within them the potential sources of confounders. And of course, this makes a difference the larger the sample you have. If you have small samples, you're more at risk of the impacts of confounders. But if you have quite a large sample, then randomization can really help to take care of a lot of those kind of hidden or unknown factors within the data. Um, and make our life a lot easier when we're trying to compare differences in treatments. And there's also blinding. Blinding, again, is something that we, we, we might do in experimental studies, but there are, you know, it is possible to, um, to kind of blind yourself, I guess, from analyses later on. Essentially, it refers to the practice of concealing group assignments from one or more individuals involved in the experiment to prevent bias. Um, so blinding ensures that participants and or researchers can participate, administer and or analyze a study without any influence. So if you're looking, sometimes, you know, you might pick certain variables because you, you think that they're going to increase the effect here and there. Um, if you're blinded, then you don't necessarily know what the treatment group is and what, what the control group is. And so you might, can't be influenced by those kinds of decisions. Um, of course, Blinding participants can help um, account for the placebo effect. 
um, blinding uh, researchers can help control, you know, maybe researchers might be more helpful to someone in a, in a, uh, um, a treatment group or, you know, might influence the results in some way. We have different terms. Single blind usually refers to participants are blinded, double blind meaning participants and administering researchers are blinded, and triple blind is when essentially participants administering researchers and the person doing the analysis are all blinded. Okay, um, and the last point I wanted to make in this kind of study synopsis section is on sample size, because we often have a lot of questions, particularly in the consulting service. A lot of people come and see me about sample size calculations, and there can be a bit of confusing confusion about what increasing your sample size will do. The first thing I would point out is that sample size reduces what's called sampling error, um, and it doesn't address bias. So if you've got a bias method of collecting data, getting more observations won't necessarily overcome that bias unless you get to full enumeration of the population. So yes, if you sample everyone, then yes, you will overcome that bias eventually. Um, but if you've got a bias method, just increasing the sample size won't fix the problem. But sample size is the only real control we have in order to um, improve what's called statistical power. Um, in our studies. So when we when we uh, kind of consider what sample size I need for my study, I think the first thing I always think about is what how many what like what's the maximum amount of observations can I feasibly get? Because if the mo maximum number of observations is you know really small, that's going to restrict what analyses you can possibly do on this. and that might also help to change our research objectives to better suit what is actually feasible. Um, but if you've got kind of a, a broad, you know, idea of what sample size you could feasibly get based on the resources and costs, um, the response rates involved, then then it sh we should be considering, you know, will, will that sample size achieve uh, sufficient statistical power um, in order to properly test my research objectives? And part of that discussion means considering, well, what what does it mean to have what's called a clinically significant effect size, which is a little bit different to significant effect size in terms of statistics, where clinically significant effect size really means, you know, what is the change we would want to see in order to have clinical relevance, in order for it to mean something within the context of your field. And that could change very drastically based on what discipline you're in or, or what, what values or measures uh, you're recording. Um, you also should consider when con you know, computing sample size, you know, will I need to perform subgroup analysis? Because the sample size, essentially the sense sample size requirement happens at the lowest level of disaggregation that you're going to have. If you want to um, an analyze a particular subgroup separate from another, from the population as a whole, the sample size requirement will happen on that subgroup, not just on the population as a, or the sample uh, size as a whole. So, you know, we also have to think about what's the finest level of disaggregation do I need reliable indicate reliable estimates on. Um, and another important point with sample size is if I want to, you know, have represented within my sample uh, particular people or characteristics, and those characteristics might be quite rare, you know, what kind of sample size will I need in order to ensure that kind of representation, that heterogeneity within my sample? Um, you could think of maybe it's a it's a um, you know a, a minority or um, disadvantaged group that you want to have present within your sample, um, and you will need. But it only happens with a very kind of small proportion of random collection. So you need a sample size large enough in order to be able to get um, proper representation of that particular minority or uh, within your sample as well. So you know a couple of different considerations there when it comes to sample size. I want to focus in a little bit more on statistical power because I think statistical power is one of those things that uh, might not necessarily be understood that well. Um, so statistical power is the probability that a test will correctly reject a false null hypothesis. Um, and if we think about it, um, you know, between statistical power and the significance level, those two things are really controlling your error rates when you perform a hypothesis test. Um, and you can think of a statistical power as more broadly the ability for a study to detect an effect that actually exists, you know, correctly identify a significant effect. 
Um, and the only things that really affect uh, statistical power are the sample size, the effect size, um, which is essentially the difference between the, the groups I'm, I'm looking for or the level of association I'm testing. Um, the significance level, which we usually always set to 0 0.05, and of course the variability or how, how much variation is in that data. So more spread data um, uh, means less statistical power, more kind of less spread in the data or less noise in the data means more statistical power. But unfortunately, we don't usually get to control the effect size or the variability within our data. The only thing we have at our disposal in order to control statistical power is really the sample size. So if we want to boost our statistical power, the only real thing we can do is increase the sample size. Um, and, you know, there are problems with using underpowered studies, so studies that don't have uh, sufficient statistical power. If your study is underpowered, then you risk not detecting meaningful differences or relationships, which basically means you're going to perform this study just to get an incon inconclusive result, um, which, you know, can be mean a, a loss of a lot of time and a, a waste of a lot of resources. Um, and this can also mean that the, you know, the contribution of your research, if you're performing an underpowered study and you end up with an inconclusive result, um, you know, the contribution of your research is probably not going to be as, uh, as important. Um, statistical power should be considered prior to conducting any study. Um, and in order to uh, compute statistical power or sample size uh, in order to achieve a specific uh, statistical power, um, you need to kind of have a really good idea of the hypothesis test you're going to be applying. So this is where the statistical analysis plan comes in. If you know what, what analysis you're going to be doing, you can get really good um, indicators of what is the sufficient sample size or what level of statistical power will my sample size achieve. Um, Power calculation should be based on domain expertise, past results, and reasonable approximations, which basically means there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Um, you can't just plop in standard numbers into the formula. You need to kind of go out and think about, well, what is the clinically significant effect size? What is the kind of level of variability I'm going to expect in my data? I should expect in my data. Um, and, you know, that will inform the statistical calculation. Um, for sufficient power, we usually use the threshold of 0 0.8. Um, and, you know, of course, more the better, but of course, the more, uh, the higher the statistical power, the more sample size uh, you'll need to achieve that. And if you're interested in kind of trying out, performing your own statistical power calculations, there is a free um, tool called GPAL, which you can get on your computer. It's really useful. Other softwares have statistical um, power calculations as well. SPSS can do it. Um, you can even just Google it online. But what I really like about GPower is it matches very nicely um, the textbook, which you can Google Cohen's textbook on computing statistical power. So you can get a little bit more reference material in there to help you make those decisions um, of how to, of what tests you will need and, you know, what, what kind of um, constitutes a small, medium or large effect size and those kind of qualitative labels that can really help in the decision-making process around what effect size should be used. Okay, um, so that was the, the first section. I think that's often the most complicated section um, when filling in a statistical analysis plan um, because there's a lot of decisions that you have to make there and um, they all have implications and you have to really kind of think about what they are. Um, but based on those that kind of setup, it will make the last two sections a lot easier because based on what variables are you collecting will dictate what analysis is, is optimal. Um, for that to, to test those research objectives. Uh, but before we get to analysis, we will talk about data management. And that is uh, a, essentially a, such an important um, concept now, particularly as people are focusing more and more on the data security issue and data privacy issues as more and more data is being collected. And you know more and more people seem to be getting access to data they shouldn't. So um, when we talk about data management, we're usually talking about some form of data governance. Um, I'm hoping people have heard of this term before, but if not, data governance refers to the overall management 
um, of the availability, availability, usability, integrity, and security of the data employed in an organization. We have a data governance policy at UOW, and we have certain obligations that we need to meet in order to um, you know, meet the guidelines of data governance or correct data governance at UOW. And that's really important to familiarize yourself whenever you're going into this into a study where you will be collecting data about particularly people. Um, and at UOW, it is required that all data that contains personal information is covered by a research data management plan. You know, basically, if you're, um, you know, your research involves information about people, then we need to have a, a proper research data management plan in place. Um, it will be part of the, it's part of the ethics process right now. So you will need it in order to get through ethics. Um, but it's also good to have, um, even if you aren't required to do ethics, if you are, you know, dealing with data um, that, that, you know, may contain some sensitive information. So what does a research data management plan involve? Well, it covers quite a lot of things. The first thing is it will cover what data sources you will need for your research study. Um, and that can be, you know, new data that you're going to produce or collect or create. It could be existing data sources. You know, you might be going and getting data from a third party or you might be getting, you know, administrative data from, you know, a, a, you know say the local health district or something like that. So it's really where, what are the data sources that, you know, we will be using in your study um, and what are kind of the, the restrictions and what form will that data take? And I will make the point that data doesn't have to be tables and spreadsheets. It can be, you know, transcripts. It can be, um, you know, video recording. It can be images. All that is a form of data and needs to be kind of considered within the world of a research data management plan. Um, you, there's also data storage uh, aspects, and if you, I've got a link in these slides, but essentially, you know, we have a list of approved data storage options at UOW. I know it used to be Cloud Store, but we've since phased out about it, and really, like the main one that they're, uh, they're recommending right now is this Microsoft Teams. Um, I will show you in a second what uh, what uh, what the Redbox um, website looks like. But if you use Redbox to create your research data management plan, um, you can actually request that that storage, an MST, MS Teams storage place is created um, as part of the research data management plan. And it will basically submit a ticket automatically to IMTS to set one up for you. So it makes the process really, really easy. Um, but data storage is really important because it, it manages the risks associated with the data. You know, who has access to it? Where is it being stored? Is it being backed up? You know, if you go out and collect all this data um, on individuals and then lose it, then that's, you know, that's problematic. That's really problematic. So having safe storage is important, not just for the security implications, but also uh, we don't want to waste people's time because essentially you just burden them for no real, for no real benefit. Data usage is also an important aspect of any research data management plan. You know, when we collect data about individuals, there needs to be a benefit of some 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 variety to to warrant the the burden that that is in, implied on participants when they're providing us with their data. You know, even if the burden is pretty minor, like a you know completing a survey or whatever, there are still risks involved whenever anyone participates in a study. And so, if you don't have a kind of a a, a useful purpose for your data, then you, it's kind of unethical to collect it. Um, and also, you know, if the the usage plan for that data isn't going to benefit them, you know, if I'm collecting data on um, individuals, you know, in order to better tax them or something, it's not necessarily the best use of that data and people should be informed of why that you're collecting their data. Um, who will need access to the data is is really important. Um, this particularly when we're talking about uh, data privacy, um, you know the data contacts, and I'm going to talk about this quite a lot because so again, this is an area which I care a lot about. Um, but who has access to the data changes the implications for for the data privacy risk. Um, you know, if it's just the research team, that's very different to if it's you know any researcher in. The world or if it's the general public the 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 conditions 
um, and the risks involved change dramatically based on who has access to that data. Um, data ownership is also a, a big port, a big problem, particularly when you're collaborating with third parties. You know, in general, if you're a researcher at UOW and you're doing a study and it's just you and you're not collaborating with an external partner, then UOW will end up owning this data. Um, but if it's if it's if you're you know say you're collaborating with Islet or you're collaborating with some other kind of organization, then understanding who actually owns this data is it might be really important and you know might have to discuss licenses and terms of use and things like that data sharing is a big issue when we're considering the data privacy implications um and so who will i eventually share this data with am i putting it in an open public an open forum um or will this kind of stay just within the research team again those implications need to be considered and finally the disposal of the data um, and, you know, I, right now for general research data, they say five years is how long you should kind of hold on to retain the data and then dispose of it after. Retaining data is important in order to be able to, you know, um, reproduce results. Say if someone identifies a mistake in your research, you need to be able to kind of go back and recheck your analysis and go, yeah, yeah, no, actually I got this result. Or, yep, you're right, you identified a mistake. Um, the other thing is that when you collect data about people, they have a right to be able to know what information about them has been used in those outputs. And so, you know, retaining that data allows them an opportunity in order to be able to, um, to you know, to see what data was actually collected about them. Um, and, you know, the disposal of the data at the end of the day is also really important because we can't just maintain data sets in perpetuity, um, particularly when you might you know, forget about it. It might just be sitting in a place. Nobody's really kind of watching over it or stewarding it. And that can lead to really big problems down the, down the track. All right. So I'm going to take a very brief time to talk about data privacy. Um, for those of you who don't know, my actual PhD was on an, it was in statistical disclosure control. So this is something that's very um, important to me, something I care about deeply. Um, and, you know, when we talk about data privacy, what we're really talking about is an individual's freedom from excessive intrusion and the ability to choose the extent and circumstances under which one personal information will be shared with or withheld from others. Now, I think the real takeaway from that is that data privacy is about a, a participant's control over their own data. It's not about just keeping everything secret. Um, I think a lot of people think privacy means secretiveness. It's not. It's about control and it's about allowing people the choice of what happens with their personal information. Um, and so we can collect private, inf uh, you know, sensitive information. That's okay, provided the respondents know what you're going to do with it and what happens to it. Um, we actually have legal responsibilities to protect personal information and make sure it's not reasonably identifiable. Um, that's part of the Australian privacy law. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but there is a kind of a legal responsibility in order to maintain privacy. You know, it's not just a slap on the wrist from the eth ethics committee. You can get in a lot of trouble if you don't um, consider and take care of uh, people's personal information. Um, but I think the big point I wanted to make here is that when we assess the risks of data privacy, you should always consider what situation your data is going to be in. And that's why thinking about the storage and the sharing and the access all will play into what is the process of de-identifying or what level of de-identification is reasonable um, within the context of maintaining people's privacy. I also want to point out um, that de-identified should mean not identifiable, but it doesn't in practice. Most of the time when we use the term de-identifier, we are talking about removing what we call direct ident identifiers from a data set. And, you know, a direct identifier is essentially somebody's name or their address, something that, you know, you, if you can see, uniquely identifies them. Um, and, you know, we talk about de-identifying by removing that information, but just because you've removed direct identifiers does not mean your data can't be re-identified, doesn't mean it's not identifiable. Um, and that's a really important message to take. You know, a lot of people say to me when they come and see me and I ask, you know, they, they want to send me their data. And I say, you know, is this this de-identified? What's the, what, you know, what are the ethics um, considerations, ethical consideration? Have you got ethics approval to be able to show me? 
um, and they'll say, oh, it's de-identified, I've removed the address, but that might not necessarily mean that it's not potentially re-identifiable. So it's something we should consider. Um, an indirect identifier can be used in order to re-identify data. Um, and it's a variable that in combination with other variables can be used to uniquely identify an individual. Um, and I just wanted to make you a point that a student at, an I, at MIT showed that 97% of names and addresses on the 1997 voting list for Cambridge, Massachusetts were unique using only their zip code, which is basically our postcode and their date of birth. So with just those two factors, they could uniquely identify 97% of people. And most people aren't too shy, uh, you know, about sharing when their birthday is and how old they are and what postcode they live in. And with those three bits of information, you can uniquely identify an individual 97% of the time in Massachusetts in 1997. So it's just something to consider when we're talking about indirect identifiers. Um, and so data with indirect identifiers are potentially re-identifiable in some contexts. And I make the point there in some contexts because essentially, the risk of disclosure changes based on who has access to the data. Um, so, you know, it, 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 you know, I might not necessarily know what somebody's postcode is or uh, what their what their date of birth is, but if I put this out to the general public, you know, their mum or their their friends are going to know that information, and it's going to make them much more likely to be able to re-identify an individual. And I want to make the point that, you know, not all people who attempt to re-identify people have malicious intent. In fact, it's often the concerned loved ones that are the most motivated to re-identify an individual in a public data set. And I, and I can think of an example of, you know, maybe it's a medical data set about teenagers, right? And within that data set, it, yeah, it's been, you know, de-identified, de but, um, you know, a, a parent is going to remember what the last blood pressure or, you know, the medical history of their of their kid is. Um, and based on that information, they might be able to identify them within a, a publicly shared data set and work out that, you know, maybe they've, you know, had a sexual history or engaged in drug taking or some other kind of factor because, you know, they're able to identify based on data they do know and learn more information. And so, you know, risk to data privacy, it is a balance between them. There is a cost benefit analysis, you know, greater benefit means more risk is palatable. Um, I'm not someone who says we shouldn't collect sensitive data. I think we should do it responsibly. Um, and we should also consider that there are different types of disclosure that can occur. Um, and, you know, essentially, you know, in order to, to, to be sure that that data is protected, uh, we should really consider, you know, what context it's it's being shared in. And, you know, I, I'll make the point, if you're thinking about putting personal you know, or data that contains personal information out publicly, please, please check with, you know, a statistician before you do so. Um, because it might not be obvious to you that people are identifiable, but, um, you know, if you're a statistician and they, they there are specific tools and techniques we can use to try and assess disclosure risk although it's not perfect. Um, at least you can, we can run over those checks over the, over the top. All right, and I just wanna kind of give a, a, a broad kind of um, overview of what type of um, things affect disclosure risk. So, you know, if, if we're dealing with historical data, that tends to be a lot less risky than current data because people forget things. Um, sample data isn't as risky, um, but population data is tends to be more risky because we can know we know that people like everyone's represented in that sample, so it makes it easier to identify. Um, administrative data, longitudinal data tend to be um, easier to to um, identify people in. Think about it this way, you know, um, I might not be able to identify an individual based on a, one transaction, but how many people, you know, go to Woolies at three times at the same time as you, right? Or use the, there's an example of this, a MyKey card, um, that data set was, was published publicly and people were actually able to identify politicians based on their Twitter posts um, when they were using the, the, the Victorian train network. So, um, you know, when you have repeated measures or longitudinal data on individuals, it makes it easier to identify them. 
hierarchical data is also easier to identify because you can leverage hierarchical structures in order to narrow down the potential um, cohorts. Of course, sensitive data, meaning you know the more sensitive data is, the more risk involved. Um, also, because it tends to be a more attractive target um, for for potential re-identification. Um, you know, da poor data quality can actually help us. You know, if there's lots of missing data and things that can actually help us to protect against uh, uh, disclosure attacks. Um, you know, using micro data, and that's essentially like the raw data cells, that's much more prone to identification than say aggregated data, which we're talking about like means and standard deviations, um, because you can uniquely identify individuals with micro data, but with aggregated data, you can't necessarily uniquely identify an individual, but you can uh, use aggregate data to, to learn specific attributes. You know, if I know that everyone who did my last subject fail, then I know that if someone did my subject, then they had to have failed. So aggregated data can also have disclosure implications. Um, and of course, key variables, you know, direct identifiers um, or variables where they're unique um, are, are the most disclosive. Okay, so that was my that was my kind of rant on um, <laughs> data privacy. Um, you know, there are there are all sorts of implications um, involved in in uh, you know collecting and um, you know dealing with confidential data, and we need to consider them in order to be um, appropriately informed. Okie dokie. So um, now let's go back to kind of planning it. Data sources, as as we said, is part of uh, the research data management plan, but it should also be part of your statistical analysis plan. Um, so, you know, we should consider what data sources are needed. Um, what data are you collecting, producing? If you're getting it from somewhere else, are there kind of um, specific restrictions involved with using data? Um, you know, you should consider what form the data will come in. Will I need to do some kind of um, re rejigging or recoding in order to kind of get it into the form needed for analysis. Uh, will I need to link data sources as well? That's a big problem. Um, and if you are going to link them, how are you going to link them? And what variables are you going to link them on? Um, when you're dealing with data, you know, different data sources, always keep a raw copy so you can always go back to it. Um, keep track of any aspects of manipulation you're going to be doing in order to get it into a form ready for analysis. And so detailing what steps involved in that um, will let you kind of help you, one, uh, prescribe timeframes, but also might help you recognize that there may be a better way to collect this data or, you know, if we store it or, or collect it in this particular form, it's going to make my job a lot easier. Um, if you're dealing with big data, there might be hardware implications. You know, I can't run it on a normal computer. I'll have to use some kind of, um, uh, you know, supercomputer in order to run this analysis. Um, and of course, if you use external data, you need to cite your sources, right? You, we always need to cite any kind of um, data that comes from someone else and provide proper, proper, um, you know, uh, recognition for, for other people's work. Um, when you want to select a statistical software, like I'm going to go over this very quickly because we actually gave a talk on this specific topic. Um, I've got a link here that will link you to the YouTube video on it. Um, but essentially, kind of the more data wrangling, the kind of more coding you will probably need. Um, and the more complex the analysis, the more likely you will need something um, like R and R Studio or, you know, specific statistical, uh, you know, heavy duty statistical software. Um, but that also means, you know, you'll need to learn how to use that software and there can be quite steep learning curves involved with using um, r and Studio. <laughs> um, and th thanks, Ryan. <laughs> um, so data cleaning is also an important part of the data preparation process and trying to really plan what your cleaning process will be at the start of a study can help you identify ways of improving your data collection to avoid da data cleaning at all. Um, the best type of data cleaning is data cleaning you don't have to do because you collected the data perfectly to begin with. So if you, um, you know, provide pre-chosen options rather than from te free text entry, then you're not going to have to go off and recode and correct people's spelling mistakes. Um, I've recently 
had to re geocode 4 million addresses based on free text entry. And trust me, it was awful. So avoid free text entry, you know, provide data validation when you can. So, you know, if you can, um, you know, search for a, for an address based on um, an address file, do that rather than letting people input things in um, themselves where they can spell their suburb in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, providing clear instructions, there's ethical uh, considerations around that as well, you know, for ESL, you know, Eng English second language people. Um, but also, you know, people are more likely to fill in data if it's if they understand what they need to put in. So making the instructions as easy and clear as possible will reduce the amount of missing data. Um, standardizing data entry using the same labels means you can run the same scripts on different variables. Um, and, you know, um, you can use mandatory fields as well, although I do warn if you don't give people an option to, to skip, sometimes they can just abandon the survey or to begin with if they don't know what to answer. Um, and training and control access, so only allowing, you know, people who know what to put into a data entry form, you know, making sure they're properly informed and trained about what very, how they should record data, that's really important too, to avoid data cleaning. Um, you know, but by planning your protocol for cleaning before collection, you can consider what might go wrong, um, and you can also avoid, again, that risk of data dredging. Um, and if you use reproducible software to perform the data cleaning, then if something changes in your underlying data set, then you can essentially just run the code again or run, run the software again um, without having to go through what is often quite a time consuming process. Um, and also if you identify issues with your specific data, then you can report them as a limitation in your study um, and go, okay, well, this is something we just can't overcome. And so we're going to have to, it allows you to identify what potential limitations might be there. Okie dokie. Um, data coding is again, another important process of, of the data statistical analysis plan. And I always think about data coding is making sure that your the, the columns of your data set match all those variables that we discussed in section one. So in this process, you're kind of forming those links between the variables of interest that you're going to use. And it, it you know once you've formed that bridge, then you can go, okay, well, now I know what my dependent variables are, you know, what columns refer to my dependent variables, what columns refer to my independent variables. And that's going to make you know, actually running the analysis a lot easier because you know which columns to put where, right? Um, so data coding is the process of really kind of matching those things. It also might mean um, computing new variables. Um, and, you know, some variables like you might want to compute, say, overweight status based on BMI or obese status based on BMI. You know, you might record BMI, but you need to compute that. Um, so there, there is, um, you know, identifying what variables need to be computed and whether or not you can actually compute it based on the variables that were collected. Um, it's important at this process as well to also provide a data dictionary or some kind of, you know, instructions to say, well, what is this variable and how is it collected and what does it relate to? And, you know, if it says one and two, what does one refer to? What does two refer to? Right. Um, so, you know, providing, doing the work now and planning that all out at this stage is going to make it a lot easier when you go to analyze it and you go, okay, what, well, what category was, um, you know, the red group? Or oh, I don't know. I think I coded it as two. I guess I coded it as one. I don't know. If I check my data dictionary, I can know exactly how I've coded things. Um, and of course, if you want to go share that with other people or with fellow members of the research team, being able to share the data dictionary will make their life a lot easier as well. Um, and the last process involved in the, the data side of things is checking checking your data and making sure that every step that you've done hasn't, hasn't changed at all. You haven't made a mistake, um, that each variable's value still makes sense. And the big thing here is to plot your data. You know, the best way, we're so good at visually identifying problems and trends. If you can plot your data and see that, it, oh, yep, no, it makes sense. That distribution makes sense for that variable. Or hang on, I've got a whole heap of negative distances. Something's obviously gone wrong in my computation. You know, you can really um, identify any problems. And, you know, what, what are the protocols involved in data checking that you're going to do and try and list some of those protocols to make sure that 
you know, you've got an appropriate um, way of, of, analyze, of checking your data. Brad, I just need to interrupt to say we've only got 10 minutes left. Okay, okay, yep, no worries. I'm on my last section. I'll, 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 I'll power through it. Um, okay, section three, this is like where all that hard work in section one and section two comes to, um, to benefit you. And it's when you actually start to plan exactly what analyses you will take. But like I said, all the hard work has already been done. All the variable definitions, all the coding, all the data prep, that's all been done. And it's actually really quick <laughs> to run analyses. Um, we usually class, uh, perform kind of two sets or two general groupings of analyses. We often provide a data description first, you know, think of, you know, we might put in a demographics or, or, or a characteristics table of the first section. So um, identifying what variables you want to describe in your data is really important. Um, you know, this, this one helps people to contextualize the data and understand, well, what, what actual sample have you collected? And is there anything a bit strange? And is that applicable to the particular problem that researcher might be having when they read your research publication? So providing a data description is, is kind of really important. Having a look at what other people have done and making sure you can kind of benchmark with them is really important. Um, you know, and it's also really important to assess, as we talked about previously, to assess representative, representativeness in non-probability samples. Um, but I will just warn that that doesn't mean it's representative, it just means it's consistent, it's an indicator. Um, you know, how do we describe data? Well, you know, we usually provide number of observations, a measure of center, a measure of spread. Um, there are other kind of indicators, maybe a description of the shape. These are all things we can use in order to describe data. Um, and I've got a, a few kind of rules there or, or kind of rules of thumb that can be applied. You know, if you're dealing with symmetric continuous disk data without outliers, we usually use mean and standard deviations, but when outliers come a thing or you've got skewed data, median might be a better indicator. <laughs> and for categorical data, proportions and frequencies are, are usually the best way to describe your data. Uh, this is all part of what's called exploratory data analysis. Um, and exploratory data analysis is all about trying to identify or familiarizing yourself with the data at hand. This can really help, um, you know, contextualize particular results that happen later down the track. So having a good, you know, plan of your exploratory data analysis can help you make sure that when you go to do your inferential analysis, you've got a you've got a pretty good idea of, you know, why, for instance, you might be getting quite strange results or different results, particularly if you've got, say, outliers present or something like that. Um, all right, now for actual your inferential analysis and analyzing outcomes, um, I will take you through a couple of different steps, but hopefully um, these steps are all kind of straightforward. So the first step is to just check your outcome variables, make sure, run any kind of diagnostics you might need to do in order to check that this is a reliable measure. So, you know, what it, you know, if it's a questionnaire scale, you might plan to run a reliability analysis to check for internal consistency. Um, and then you might have a little, you know, what if I don't meet consistency? Well, I'll run a if item is deleted analysis. Or I might go, okay, well, I don't know exactly how many, you know, incidences of a particular event will occur. So if, for instance, you know, I don't get enough incidences, I might change, you know, how I categorize or how I define an incidence to be a bit broader so I can get a, a more um, represented uh, variable within my data. So, you know, maybe it might involve re-aggregating re, re or recombining variables and having a plan of how you might do that at the start can help you design the categories for easy aggregation, but still have clinical relevance, which is really, really important. Uh, what statistical model um, should be used? Now, this is all about those dependent variables, independent variables. If you've defined them early, then this should be quite straightforward. You just say, you know, I'm going to model the dependent variable based on these independent variables accounting for these confounding or effect modifiers. You know, so if you've got those prescribed roles early, coming up with a statistical model um, is going to be pretty, should be pretty straightforward. And I'll, I'll skip that, that slide, um, but essentially a statistical model is just a mathematical representation. So, um, 
you know, we use the term statistical model a lot. It just basically means we're we're we're, we're describing a relationship between some kind of some kind of dependent variable and, and independent variables. Um, based on the the statistical model, what analysis method is best will follow quite naturally. You know, it's very kind of formulaic. If I'm comparing one dependent variable with one categorical variable and the data is nice normally distributed, I'll probably be using a t-test if it's two categories or an over if it's more than two categories. So these kind of, if you've got that statistical model down pat, you can then move to the inference and the estimates, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty obviously. And, um, you know, again, whenever we do a specific statistical test, there are going to be assumptions involved in doing that. And so taking note of how you're going to check those assumptions um, will be an important part of this plan as well. Um, here's just a quick table, which gives you a, a, a brief breakdown of how you might, you know, come to plan based on your based on your uh, statistical model. So if I have a dependent variable or response variable Y and this type of um, independent variable, you know, we can pretty easily follow what would be the best kind of analysis involved based on whether or not this is independent samples or dependent samples. And it also gives you a, a, a kind of rough guide of how to phrase that particular hypothesis test that you are that you are performing. Okay, step four is, you know, sometimes we don't meet the assumptions of our test. So having a kind of a backup plan for what happens if you don't meet those assumptions or if you need a kind of change your analysis, having that kind of thought out first will make your life a lot easier down the track. Often we can find a non-parametric alternative to a specific parametric test, um, or it might involve transforming a variable or you know, changing the scale or something like that. Um, considering how you're going to deal with missing data, coming up with a kind of a, a clear plan at the start, you know, or some, some criteria in order to identify, you know, whether or not I'm going to exclude a variable or impute a variable, having that plan you know, kind of established now allows you to have a set protocol, particularly in the data cleaning um, points. And also, you can also, you know, come up with a plan to how it's going to, how to check whether or not, you know, your decisions around missing data ended up affecting the results. Um, you know, there might be other kind of decisions that you want to check the, check how they influenced your analysis. Um, so sensitivity analysis is essentially, you know, trialing a different, a different type of analysis and seeing how that affects the results. So, you know, maybe particular choice of what, what independent variables or confounders you add. If you plan to assess the role of a particular confound by doing um, different analyses, having that set plan laid out here makes people confident that you aren't data dredging, that this was part of the plan to begin with. Um, and you can also check whether or not, you know, specific model assumptions or specific uh, analyses say, you did a mixed effect model, but you want to see if a GE might be better um, than, uh, you know, performing a sensitivity analysis around that might be important. Or even just, you know, what happens if I include or exclude outliers. And the, the kind of the last two steps um, is what happens at the end point. What am I going to get out of this analysis? How am I roughly going to report this? You know, I'm going to get out statistics, p-values, confidence intervals, you know, am I going to put that in a table? Am I going to use it in text? Um, what data visualizations are you going to produce? And, you know, is this for a research article? Because, you know, you might, you know, get some static figures. But if you're doing this for a client, maybe you want to do an interactive data visualization or a dashboard. There are lots of different ways in which we might, you know, um, visualize or express our data. So, um, you know, I have, a, I have a whole talk on this. We can, you know, uh, we can discuss this later. But a data visualization, you know, having a rough idea of how you're going to um, visualize this and communicate your results can, at least in your own mind, make it very clear what what uh, time frame might be involved in producing these these visualizations. And of course, you know, we we laid out this process, but the last step is to repeat this for any other um, outcomes of interest. So, you know, for each outcome of interest, you would go through this process. You know, um, from step one to seven. Um, uh, performing the analysis. All right, um, I think I've run out of time, but I've also attached um, at the end of this talk a few best practices that might be involved in statistical analysis. 
So, you know, um, about essentially about using uh, open source software, data sharing, um, you know, documenting data, version control, all of these things are important practices, good practices that you can um, plan to do at the start of your study that can really make a big difference about the reproducibility, the impact, and the um, ability for you to streamline processes um, and save yourself some time. All right, um, that's that's all for me. Uh, sorry I've used the whole time, but there was a lot to talk about. Um, and you can see there's a, a lot of um, a lot of things involved in a statistical analysis plan. I will also say that everything I've talked about today can be found in a template online on the Community of Practice um, uh, Community of Practice page. So if you go to the Community of Practice page, you can go to the website, and it should be on the very first page. You can download a template, and on that template, it will have all the all the things that we talked about today. So, um, you know, sample selection outcomes, data cleaning, data checking. So you can actually go through this process and apply it to your own research. Um, yeah, cool. Thank I think that's that's it. Are, are there any questions? Oh, just checking. All righty. Um, of course, as well, the Statistical, Statistical Consulting Centre is available to you if you want to sit down with me and go through some of these things. We can chat, um, chat through each of the problems or if you have any specific questions. Um, that's that's my job. I love doing it. So, you know, check out the statistical consulting website. You can always um, book an appointment. Um, where can you get the slides? You can get them on the data and decision science initiative. I'll also share them in the community of practice page. It's uh, probably, it'll probably just take us a couple of days.